I'm John Allen, I'm the farm manager for Maristow Estate in West Devon. We are on Nat's farm, which is a, a 300 head spring calving herd on a, on a grass-based um, system. So obviously our, our focus is really producing milk from grass, uh, so we're looking for a, a, a 500 to 550 kilo cow and producing a kilo of milk solids per kilo of live weight um, and keeping our concentrates uh, to a minimum, maximising the use of grass efficiently. So in the breeding side, we're looking for a cow very good on her legs and feet with a, with a strong udder for longevity. Uh, they'll have to walk on this farm up to a kilometre and a half. So uh, good locomotion is, is really important to us. Um, good udder attachment um, for keeping udders clean and hy hygienic for milking. Um, and we want e exceptional fertility with these cows uh, which is where, where we can score with the, with the crossbred genetics, uh, getting that gain in fertility from heterosis. Yeah, one of the things uh, we've been looking at is, is improving our, our genetic base on the herd. Now it's established and um, we're trying to, we're, at the moment we're achieving about 80% uh, milk solids uh, to live weight. So there's, there's a bit of a challenge for us now to, to take that forward um, through more selective breeding. We're weighing our cows and uh, looking at those cows at the, the, the far end of the bell curve, the ones that give us the real return, the, the best, the top 20% performers, and really focusing on those to, to breed our future generation. Uh, so on the, on the first round of our grazing, uh, we're looking to complete the um, roughly about 60% about of our grazing by the middle of March to set up the pastures for the remainder of the grazing season, getting those at the optimum quality. The, uh, the calving pattern for the herd, um, obviously on a spring calving system, is, is, is essential to us, and the tighter we can get it, the better. What we're aiming for is, is a 10-week block, and what we have at the moment is a 12, but ideally, looking forward, we'd, we'd be looking to have a 10-week calving block. Yeah, we're looking for a submission rate um, before we start serving of, of uh, over 90%, both on the cows and definitely on the heifers. We want 80% uh, of the cows in calf um, within the first six weeks of the block, which we're achieving with these cows. And um, we're looking probably an empty rate of around 5%. In, in terms of the uh, breeding, we're, we're, we are breeding for fertility. We want to breed the right type of cow uh, that can um, survive and, and adapt on our system being grass-based. Uh, when there is ample grass, they need to be able to survive and get back in calf uh, purely on, on the grass-based, if that is on the grass-based system, if that's required. <clears throat> and and that's, that's a real flexible part of our system eh, with these genetics and these types of cows. Hello and welcome to the first webinar introducing Walford Farm, part of North Shropshire College as LSE's new monitor farm. These webinars are to replace the open day that we had to cancel. Um, and as this is the first webinar we've ever done, I do apologise for any glitches that we may encounter tonight and uh, please bear with us. To give you a bit of a background on the monitor farm process, uh, we meet with the farm on a monthly basis and all the uh, reports that we uh, do with them are then posted on the Facebook page. Uh, we hold two open days every year uh, to allow everyone following along the ability to come onto farm and have a feel of what changes and progress is happening on farm. As part of this, we look to get feedback as well as goals from the participants. Uh, so you will receive an email after tonight's webinar and uh, subsequent webinars uh, where you can put down goals that you think will be relevant to the farm and follow along, see if we achieve them. Um, so yeah, please do put forward your, forward your goals as we'll be using these to push ourselves and the farm towards coming into an autumn block, uh, autumn block farm. I'll now start off by introducing uh, myself and I'll pass around the other panel members. I am Sean Chubb, a pasture profit consultant for LIC, working within the Midlands and Wales. Um, I'm the one who will be working with Walford Farm uh, through the monitor farm process. Um, so yeah, I will now pass you on to Mark to introduce himself. Yeah, thanks Sean. So yeah, I'm Mark Ryder, the General Manager for LSE in Europe. 
Uh, just firstly, just like thank Tom and the team at Welford College for uh, joining with us on this three-year journey and opening themselves up to scrutiny from outside um, as we join them on the journey. So Monitor Farms for LIC are a very important part of our business. We do a lot of one-on-one -on -one consultancy with farmers as they transition from one system to the other. Uh, but with the Monitor Farm, we're able to demonstrate to a wider group of farmers, you know, how you get from A to B and the likely challenges you're going to strike along the way. Uh, so you actually get a roadmap. So uh, very valuable to us. We see ourselves as leaders in the in the grass-based system. Um, so this is an opportunity for us to demonstrate some of that leadership across the industry. Um, so yeah, please enjoy. Uh, as Sean said, it's a webinar for the first time for us. So um, yeah, a bit of learning at both ends on this one. So thanks for those that have joined us and yeah, really hope you get something out of it and hope to see you along the journey along the way. Thank you. Emia. I'm uh, Emma Brown. I'm Farm Solution Manager uh, for, with LIC. I cover uh, Mid and West Wales and the Shropshire and the Borders. Um, been with the company for seven years. Uh, my role really is working with Tom on the breeding over the next few years, um, looking to uh, move it, as Sean said, to an autumn block and the priority for the first few years is going to be fertility. Now I'll move you on to Tom, who's the farm manager. Hi there, um, I'm Tom Moore. Um, yeah, let's say welcome to everybody. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I've been involved in uh, grazing units for the last nine years, um, but this is probably going to be my biggest challenge today, um, converting an all-year-round carbon to a um, tight autumn block herd. Um, I came to Walford in um, November, uh, December 2019, um, sorry, 2018, um, and I just took on the challenge of um, managing the farm in July. Um, and uh, it was clear, you know, we had a lot of things to change. Um, to get this herd to where we want it to be. Um, yeah, we, you know, we've struggled with fertility, we're struggling with um, milk yield off a typical horse line herd. Um, yeah, with just some cost of production. So a change to our new system, hopefully will hopefully change the issues that we've had on the farm so far. Um, I think I'll pass to Sarah now from uh, LIC. Yes, hi, I'm Sarah, um, and I'm going to be the moderator uh, tonight. So I'm going to be questioning Tom and the rest of the team um, about the process and, and how the farm is going along at the moment. So first of all, Tom, let's talk about the farm itself. Um, I think it would be useful if you could tell us the size of the farm, the sort of acreage that you've got and what crops you're growing at the moment. So we're we're 143 hectares. Um, we will roughly grow around 50 acres of maize a year, um, but this year we've um, put on the burner because we've got enough maize in the clamp. Um, but we're looking to put um, some stubble turnips in for our winter in, and some red clover in to boost our, for our quality of our forages. Um, so yeah. Um, I think we missed there. Sorry, Tom, we missed the size Sorry. of the farm. We're looking at a map now of the farm, but um, it went a bit distorted. We missed the, the total acreage of the farm. So it's, the total acreage is 143 hectares, um, but it's a 63 hectare grazing platform, which you can see on the map there. Right. And can you just talk us through what the red lines indicate? Um, the red lines are cow tracks, the new infrastructure that we put in. Um, since October, um, all sand based, um, all quarried off the farm, um, done in house. Um, took us about three weeks to do it. Uh, some long days, but very worth it. Um, very beneficial to the cows, as we've already seen. Um, and in terms of perhaps you can talk, we talked about the milking platform and the infrastructure. I think there have been some quite big 
changes to the infrastructure. We're looking at the dairy parlour at the moment. Perhaps you'd like to talk us through that. Uh, well, th this is our uh, current parlour. It uh, was installed, I think, in 2015. Um, it's a uh, forward 24-24 um, herringbone. Um, has the capacity to go to, f go to 15 units a side, um, but it's not something we've, we're really looking at. Um, we've got in parlour feeders on order, so and they're the last of our real infrastructure change, if I'm honest. Um, but that'll be the next big leap for us, I think, as well. Um, and then we haven't talked about the number of cows you've got there. How many cows do you have on the farm? Uh, so we're currently milking around 150 cows at the minute, um, all year round calving. Um, there's um, quite a few followers to come through in the next couple of years as well, though. I mean, we've got about 100, 115 heifers waiting to come into the herd in the next two years. Um, so there's plenty of an opportunity to increase the numbers of the herd as well going forward. Where, where, what's the aim with that? Where do you think you'll end up with numbers? 250 is the goal. Um, yeah, 250 I think is where we want to be um, to really push this herd on and make it an attractive prospect for, for students and for the outside community. Now, that's a, an interesting point. I mean, how does the college work in with the farm and how does this impact the running of the farm? Um, it, it, very closely. Um, there's a very close relationship, obviously, with the college. It's, you know, the farm does belong to the college, I suppose. Um, we have students on farm three days a week. Um, they do their various duties, um, milking, calf rearing, um, yard work. They're starting to get involved. I think we'll start getting involved in grazing and things like that. Um, but yeah, the, the student students are vital to what we do. And you know, you know, in some ways we're critical, critical to what the students do as well. And what made you decide? I mean, obviously we've heard already we are making or you are making some quite radical changes on the farm. Mm. Um, what made you seek to make these changes? Uh, past experiences. Uh, um, and the cost of production that was currently on the farm and the, um, the, the access we had to forage outside, out the back of the farm, I thought was we wasn't utilising it very well and it was a perfect opportunity to utilise it. Um, so that I think you know this system is really key for us and in a way to be unique as well as a learning facility in promoting grass-based farming. So let's just talk at the moment a little bit about the yield per cow and your calving pattern at the moment. Um, currently we're averaging around 8,700 litres of cow um, and we're all year round, but there is a slight emphasis on autumn calving within the herd. Um, so the transition actually is going to be not too bad moving forward, we don't think. Um, so yeah. And, and in terms of um, best practice and animal welfare, yeah, um, yeah. how are you working Sorry. on that at the moment? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's our main goal. Um, animal welfare and best practice towards, um, best practice to the new generation of farmers coming through and farm workers and um, obviously to the public as well and to the community you know what we want to be you know pioneering in that sort of thing and obviously being a grass-based farmer I think it's going to help us as well and have a higher welfare herd. Now when you took over as farm manager what priorities were put on you what were you told you had to achieve? Uh, best practice was one of the emphasis on high welfare um, break even was one of the targets of the farm as it's obviously not made money for quite a while um, but I don't think you can have best practice and not be profitable so I think personally from a personal point of view I put the emphasis on being profitable as well to promote best practice. Yeah I, I know we're going to go into the figures in a lot more detail in our, our second webinar but just to give our, our viewers our listeners a, an idea um, where were you in cost of production um, and how was so, it made up when, when you came to the farm? Cost of production 
gin in for the 2017 2018 was 66 pence per litre. A third of that cost came from feed and bedding alone. I think that will surprise quite a few people. Um, obviously, mm. at that level, you weren't making a profit at all. Um, right. What, whereabouts, what, what was the sort of deficit that you were looking at in, in terms of annual figures? Oh, I, yeah, I'd, I'd have to look, look. I can't really, I've not really seen, um, not looked too much into it because we've merged, the college itself has had a bit of a merger with another set of colleges, so we've not actually took time to look at that. Um, we're just basing on historical figures and our running cost. Um, but yeah, the, the farm was losing a lot of money. It would have a been a significant amount of money. So yeah. quite, quite a big change that you're going to go through now. Massive. Um, some changes for the good. <laughs> I keep telling myself. <laughs> Doesn't make your job easier, does it? <laughs> no. um, and I guess, um, have you seen any priorities? I know we're looking at the tracks now that have gone in on the farm. Um, yeah. A nice shot there. Um, now, I mean, have you seen any big changes that have already started happening within the herd and within the profitability on the farm? Um, milk from forages. Uh, doubled if not tripled already um we've got we're getting more cows out bedding costs are dramatically changing um amount of bedding using um morale has been the biggest change i think on the farm um you know people are smiling people are happier you know, cows are out you know life's not getting easier but it's making the day easier have seen the cows out not stuck in a shed all the time and working in the you know working under a roof and um it's just yeah it's made a massive difference to how everybody feels um which i think has been the biggest thing um for us all and seeing the end product from all the work we've put in since october as well we're starting to reap the benefit how i mean a question now i mean looking at these tracks um i can see these as sand tracks but i mean have you seen improvements in lameness, for example, from putting these tracks in? Talk us yeah, through we, how were the cows yeah, been before? We, we suffered um, with a lot of digital dermatitis before and we had um, a lot of white line. Um, we recently just had the trimmer in the last few days and he commented the feet are a lot better. There's a, a little bit of bruising because they're used to going out and walking a bit further now. But um, yeah, a massive difference. Massive, massive difference in lameness is, is reduced and mastitis is reduced. Um, just general cow health, really. Um, it's all on the up. And why did you go for the number of paddocks that you've got now? I think before the farm was in four or five fields, was it? Yeah, it was just four or five fields. Um, set start, pretty loose. Cow tracks were non-existent. Um, wasn't really a walk. Walk troughs were pretty poor 20 mil ring main very little walk pressure um so we went for the three hectare paddocks because we're, we're obviously looking to the future when we get to obviously the set number of cows we're looking at 24 hour grazing on a paddock grazing system and um increase efficiency and make it more yeah make, yeah just make it more simple um now, I mean, obviously, you've gone for more paddocks, which enables you to rotationally graze a lot more, um, a lot more efficiently. Talk us through that a little bit. I can see some grass, nice grass growing here. Yeah, well, we're, we're able to, um, yeah, we're able to break break the paddocks, protect regrowth, and encourage, and then encourage grass growth now as well. Um, so the cows are able to maintain going out longer, and. Main, we can keep the cows going on to fresh paddock, fresh grazing. Um, without the fencing and the paddock infrastructure, we just couldn't make it work. No, I, I can imagine that was quite difficult. And I mean, when did you turn out this year? Have you changed how long the cows are out at grass? Um, well, our low yielding cows went out, I think, on the 21st of January. Um, and they've stayed out pretty much throughout. They're out in the day. Yeah, out in the day since 21st, when well, they went out at night around mid-February. Um, the high yielders started to go out at night, towards, out in the day towards the end of February. Um, now, the, now the whole herd's together. 
and grazing in one mob and they're out day and night. And I know at the time we did have a question on Facebook about keeping the cows out in what was at the time very wet conditions. How did you feel about that? About the wet conditions? Um, yeah. From my experiences, it was just a, a case of managing it differently. Um, it was a, yeah, it was a, probably a little bit of a shock for these type of cows. Um, but, you know, we had a high high cover at the start and we needed to get that cover down to be able to optimise our grass now at this time of year. Um, so in the back of my mind, I knew the cows were doing a specific job and a job that needed to be done. And then, you know, obviously um, we can move on to the cows a little bit. And Amir, perhaps you'd like to come in here now because we have obviously, we've seen some pictures of the cows. They, they look quite um, Holstein-based cows. Um, obviously that isn't the normal sort of cow that we would have in a grazing system. Tell us how the type of cow that's on the farm is going to change over the next few years. Yeah, the cow that's on there now is, um, there's some very extreme Holsteins. Also, there is some quite reasonable Frisians. So over the next uh, three, four years, some of the Holsteins will be put to a crossbred bull to get it down, get the weight down a bit uh, to about 550 kilos. But I think some of the cows now are over 700 kilos. Um, and then the cows which are out the right size for Tom and the system. Uh, we'll use a New Zealand Frisian, um, which, but also the fertility was the main aim really. To get these cows in calf as uh, that was a major issue. Um, and I think, again, we're going to go into the breeding in a lot more detail in a, in a future program. But Sean, as far as you're concerned, what were the challenges looking at getting this type of cow to graze? Uh, hitting residuals was my main main fear that uh, would turn them out and would only be achieving uh, 1,800, 1,900 residuals, and then we're going to have to mechanically uh, recreate, uh, re uh, mechanically correct the pasture to keep, keep the quality there. Um, but yeah, ultimately. The cows are going out and actually graze really well. Um, I'll probably put a lot of that down to Tom's managing of buffer feed for night feeding of the cows. So when they are going out, they are going out hungry and they are um, pushing residuals down. I did give Tom the target of uh, achieving a constant residual of uh, about 1,600 kgs of dry matter by the end of the year. Um, he's already reaching that or even um, bettering that in some paddocks. So yeah, that, that side of things has gone really well. The other aspect that I was um, somewhat concerned about was the um, fertility and getting the cows into a block. Um, but yeah, again, the, um, this mating season's gone uh, reasonably well with uh, getting around a third of the, the cows within the first six weeks in calf. So yeah, extremely happy about that. And going back to you, Tom, um, what, what are your aims in terms of milk production? Um, I mean, a lot of people are switching from perhaps going for quantity always to doing more of a quality job and looking for butter fats and proteins. Where are you with that? And is that one of your objectives? Um, yeah, I mean, increasing milk solids is always um, on the agenda. Um, we're not currently paid for our protein, but more for our fats. So there is a bit of a, a bonus for us to do that, but, but I want this to be a grazing there that can still produce a bit more milk as well. So, you know, we're thinking around the seven and a half thousand litres um, mark. Um, with five, five and a half thousand litres from forage would be the ideal. Um, but yeah, you know, we're, we're seriously keen on pushing these cows to the, to the max and being more profitable than, than what we have been and, you know, really... Um, setting a new, set a new target. And and Mark, it would be interesting to hear from you how this compares with a New Zealand grazing system and a New Zealand uh, cow. Is that the sort of levels that we're seeing in New Zealand? Uh, yeah, it's you know it's case by case, and um, yeah, Tom's identified what uh, his KPIs are. Of course, milk payment systems will vary a lot more here to what they do. Uh, back in New Zealand, um, but yeah, very realistic targets. 
um, and um, there's no reason why uh, the cow that it, that Emmy is talking about won't deliver that. So um, and maintain the fertility as well. So let's talk a little bit about the challenges that you now face, Tom. Have you come across new challenges that perhaps you didn't think were there at the beginning? Um, yeah, I mean, images, the image of the, the whole job is one of the challenges. Um, changing the perception. Um, this, you know, this farm and the herd alone has probably been a high yielding herd for a very long time. Um, and changing that, not the mindset perhaps of, you know, the people in within the college, but you know, the people outside who've been to the college or worked at the college, you know, they'll be, you know, changing their minds in in what this we're gonna make this farm become. Um obviously welfare and environment are very high over being a college farm. We're very much scrutinized being out into the public eye. Um you know, fertility's always gonna be a challenge. Um you know, we it's one of the biggest probably one of our biggest costs this farm has actually been fertility in the past um but we think we're getting a hand on it now and getting control of it and we think we can move forward um but yeah you know, they're pretty much our challenges i've seen today and and uh sean you talked about the challenge with with the grazing um residuals what are the other challenges that, that you see that tom's got to come up with answers to in the next 12 months uh, so the next 12 months will be uh, the, the young stock coming through, uh, you know, getting them in calf and then keeping them in the block. So that, that's going to become part of the challenge going forward uh, up until we can get some of the um, newer, hopefully more fertile stock coming through to, to actually keep them within the block. Um, and then, uh, yeah, also just managing the, the cows at grass through the winter time, uh, sorry, the summertime, when they go into uh, going to be dry, uh, ensuring that they don't put on too much condition and yeah, that they're in the correct condition to calf down. And Amir, from a breeding point of view, what are the biggest challenges? Well, you know, fertility, I think, is the biggest um, challenge, but um, also to achieve this block. Um, he has done very well at the moment uh, with his, when we started AI in, in November, it's gone well. Um, and the plan is now to AI some in June and then move them again in another year. But I think, you know, there's a major challenge with fertility here, uh, but we're getting over it quietly. Um, yeah, the figures look better than I expected this year for what we've done so far. Um, Mark, I mean, I, I know from LIC's background, fertility is a key issue in New Zealand. Um, where do you see it fitting into a farm situation like this? I think fertility, I think, yeah, New Zealand aside, fertility is a key uh, for, for most dairy systems, regardless of what you're doing. Cow needs to be calving as close to 365 days a year. Um, yeah, regardless of whether you're in an all year round system or not. Um, you know, it's important that you get that peak flush of milk that comes with uh, following calving, new lactation, that sort of thing, plus the opportunity for the cow to replace herself within the herd. Uh, so, yeah, fertility is key uh, globally uh, for, for dairy. Um, and a calve, when you go into a block system, um, it's equally as important. You need to be uh, calving tightly to um, maximise pasture growth when it's at its peak. Um, and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, hugely important. And let's just go back, Tom, for a minute. We didn't really talk about what you're feeding the cows. Um, perhaps we could go back a little bit and talk about feed, um, because I've got a question here about also how you're improving your grassland knowledge to make the most of the forage part um, of the ration, because you're saying how important that's going to be moving forward. Uh um, so in terms of feed, um, we're currently feeding uh, around six kilos of blend. Uh, it was an eighteen percent protein blend, and um, it's out in the shed with a little bit of silage at the minute. You know that's going to change when the feeders are in. Um, <laughs> in terms of uh, change my grassland knowledge, um, working with Sean pretty closely is going to help with that. I think um, 
with all yourself from LIC. Um, but just you know, sticking to the basics of what I've done in the past, really. And a cow's a cow, whether she's black or white, whether she's red or brown, it doesn't matter. A cow's a cow, she'll eat grass no matter what. Um, I mean, that's the key thing. Just yeah, get it um, in them. <laughs> and your decision to put in some maize and um, some stubble turnips, what was behind that? Uh, the maize, the maize. Well, we need the maize really for winter feed. Um, so we need that surplus tons of dry matter um, to feed the cows through the winter and then also it'll help push the cows on through the winter period we think and um, put, get a bit more milk out of them um, the stubble turnips this year are probably a one off if I'm honest um, they're more for that's for out winning for the young stock and for the um, current sheep flock we have at the at the college um, and that's just a case of us utilising ground the best we can while we're on the low stocking rate um, and we've got another question that's come in here about silage. We haven't talked about you making silage when you're going to think you're going to make your first cut, how many cuts you're going to take and what sort of silage quality you're looking for. Um, like any farmer, the best quality you can make, but really we've really got 12 ME silage really, um, or close to um, quality over quantity. So I think our first cuts are probably planned from the beginning of May. Um, and our second cut will include our red clover. Um, you know, which small cuts, um, the preference over quality over quantity, but yeah. Okay, um, and a question for you again, Tom. Um, I'm being asked, what were the key changes that you've implemented to increase your milk from forage so drastically? And what were you able to do to achieve this? The infrastructure was the biggest thing. Um, able to get cows out to paddock, be able to train these cows to eat grass and be able to, you know, um, able, yeah, the, just the whole infrastructure and the water, that everything we did um, has just improved that massively. I mean, we're averaging 24 litres in a minute and we're doing on average 12 litres um, from forage. So really from the grass and a little bit of size you're getting in the shed at this present moment in time. And just to remind everyone where you were before the changes, in terms of amount of milk forage? Around the four litre mark was really low. We're feeling a lot of a lot of forage, a lot of concentrate, um, and getting very little getting very little milk back from our foragers. So Sean, let's talk a little bit more about grass um, and how important grass is, because we're hearing how how important grass is now in, in the ration. What yep. advice are you giving Tom to make sure that he can maximise grass growth um, in terms in terms of rotational grazing, managing the grazing? Uh, so at this time of year, heading in towards balance day or match day or whatever you want to call it, um, I, I'm, well, the target is to get the average farm cover down around um, 1,900 kgs of dry matter per hectare, and that will allow us to fully graze out the farm properly to nice low covers. Um, that will give us quality coming through into the second round. Uh, that will also give us a, a good wedge. We're not going to go into a um, go from a boom to bust sort of situation or, or bust to boom um, if we lift the average farm cover high. Uh, and then once we come out of um, uh, lift, lift up the farm cover, average farm cover from 1900, we're going to settle around um, 2122 average farm cover and we'll carry that through until the cows dry off. And then probably at that time, um, being a sand-based farm, uh, growth rates will drop off. So we'll be matching growth with demand. And is that going to be managed, going to have to be managed very carefully? I mean, is Tom going to be out there with a plate meter? How are you going to measure grass growth? And how often should he be doing that? Uh, well, my, my expectation is that uh, the paddocks are measured weekly. And yeah, so Tom does have a have a plate meter. He's using Agronet, so everything's going into Agronet, and he's using the grass budgets on there to you know help monitor his average farm cover growth, um, the rotation speed, um, all of that. So that, that's our main tool uh, when we're talking about grass. Generally, that that tool's opened in front of us. And Tom, going going back to you. Um, how are you finding monitoring grass growth? Is it something you've been doing before or is this new to you? 
Um, that is something I'm pretty used to, to be honest. Um, I've done it for the last um, nine years. Um, it's been a it's been a big learning curve in the nine years, but you, got, you know you're learning every day. But it's um, yeah, to be honest, it's yeah, it's pretty much bread and butter. If I'm honest, without be sounding too arrogant. <laughs> Right. Well, I think we've had a very interesting first session. Um, I'd like to go to, oh, we've just had another question come up. Sorry. Um, when are you, sorry, uh, when are you targeting your autumn block and why? Um, so, yeah, um, um, we're aiming to carve the cows in August, um, September and October. Um, emphasis on trying to get 50% carved in the August. Um, there's two reasons really. Um, one of the reasons is our seasonality for our milk contract currently to maximise that. Um, the other reason is to give students the opportunity to get involved in carving and everything around carving. Um, so when they come back in September, they'll have there'll be 50 percent left of the herd to carve. So they'll see, you know, the, the bread and butter of the block carving system really. Um, calves on the ground, cows, cow numbers going up, cows increasing. Um, not necessarily, hopefully not the manicness, but yeah, um, that type of system is what we want to show these guys and hopefully they can learn from it. Okay. Well, obviously I think we've covered quite a lot of ground today and we've ended up with a very good background on, on the farm. Um, we're going to be continuing this set of webinars over the next few weeks. Um, and I think... I'm going to go to each of you in turn just to ask you to summarize what you think perhaps the first, the, the, the most important KPIs are that we should be monitoring as we go through this series of webinars. So let's ask Sean first. Uh, so for me, the um, CFP, uh, so that's your comparable farm profit. So profitability of the farm, there'll be uh, uh, or that, that's one KPI that's been put forward by uh, management um, of the college. So that's one thing that we'll be following. Um, obviously, we're moving to an autumn block uh, calving pattern. So conception rate, uh, three week submission rate, and um, you know non return rate and six week in calf rate are going to be some very vital um, targets going forward. But obviously, this year we're mainly focusing on just three. Um, Three of them being non-return rate, um, submission rate, and six-week and calf rate, as those three are the ones that will, you know, give us the the crux of our um, our herd that will be, you know, the, the base that we'll build from. And then lastly, it's just hush eaten. You know, how many tons of grass can we um, harvest per hectare? Amir, what do you see as the key KPIs moving forward? Fertility for me uh, to get these cows to calve in to get the block round and uh, um, eventually, hopefully, to get into a 10 week block. Um, this year they served for 14 weeks and they were stopped, and then we're going to serve another block in June. So, for another six to eight weeks. And, um, hopefully, then the farm will be in two blocks and then we can move them forward to the autumn. But fertility, fertility get the cows in calf and milk in. Okay, and Tom? Uh, yes. So the rest of the guys, fertility and increase the profitability of the farm. Uh, we are main KPIs and showing progress. That's Sorry. What want to be. Tom, we're losing you a little bit there. I think you said fertility Sorry. and profitability. So yeah, and just progressing, um, progressing the farm to where we want to be in the next 12 months, and then hopefully the 12 months after that, have it where we want it to be, is, where we, is where what we're looking at. Okay, and Mark, as, a, as an LIC monitor farm? Oh, well, I guess Sean covered off the key KPIs that we'd see um, from an LIC perspective. I guess the animal welfare one's uh, quite a big one. Um, I'd really be interested in the... Um, you know, the CFP data and how that changes um, over the next 12 months with the change in system. Yeah, but right. I think I think Sean gave a pretty comprehensive coverage of what the KPI should be. Okay, well, it just leaves me to say thank you very much to all of our panellists tonight. 
Thank you for everybody who's sent in questions and I hope you're happy with the answers that you've had. Um, and to tell everybody that because it's Easter next weekend, our next webinar will be on the 17th of April at exactly the same time at six o'clock. Um, we will be reminding people and we will be promoting this through social media. So we'd be very grateful if everyone who's watched tonight would share this. Um, we will also be putting the webinar um, up live on the LIC website um, after the weekend. Um, so there will be an opportunity to see it there and it will also be on YouTube and we'll point you to YouTube as well. So you can share this with your friends and colleagues. Thank you very much, everyone. Stay safe.